All right, welcome to another episode of Lions Guy Podcast. And today I've got Mr. Nick Lavery, who is active duty Army, Special Forces Warrant Officer, Green Berets, right, Nick? That's correct. Green Beret. Uh, actually considered the first Green Beret to return to combat as an above the knee amputee, which I'm sure I've got questions about, you know, as a, as a veteran, that seemed like really unique for you to kind of be able to stay in service, especially combat service for that. So I'm, I'm interested to kind of pick around that, uh, but also TEDx speaker, author of the new book, Objective Secure, which we'll dive into. And Nick, welcome to the show, my man. Thanks, Dale. It's good to talk to you, man. Yeah, definitely. So give us a quick version of who you are and what do you do? Yeah, I mean, you hit the professional stuff uh, already, man. Been doing this now about 14 and a half years. Um, originally from Boston, Mass. You know, people probably would have figured that out here pretty quick. I grew up there, <laughs> born and raised. Um, entered the military after college. I ended up going up and uh, attending University of Massachusetts up at Lowell. Played football up there um, and got out. Uh, after I graduated and started looking at, at options to enlist, I came in as a special forces recruit, otherwise known as the 18 X-ray program, which gives guys off the street the chance to just go straight into the Army Special Forces. And I've uh, been doing that really ever since. Um, last and certainly not least, I'm sure something we'll, we'll get into is I'm um, a proud father of two young boys. Oldest is four, going on five here in April. And our youngest is about to be 10 months. Uh, my wife is also active duty army. She's actually currently deployed. And uh, yeah, man, they are the, the the highlight of my life and deeply rooted into the why, uh, which again, I feel like we'll probably, probably touch on here as we go. Yeah, definitely. It, and I guess like, I'm always interested in people's background. So, and that's a question I have for you. So you did college before you did service. But did you Correct. go in as an officer or did you go in enlisted? I came in enlisted. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's funny. I've, I've been asked that question before, you know, <clears> why <throat> didn't you come in as an officer? And it's, there's a couple of reasons. One is the, the 18 X-ray program is only offered to enlisted guys. Mm. So if you wanted to come in as an officer, that wouldn't be an option for you. You'd have to come in, go through the regular army process and then request to go to selection and go that route. Coming in as enlisted, it it gave me the chance to do the x-ray program, the 18 x-ray program, um, which I was drawn to mostly because of the speed in which it could get me into special operations, which is where I knew I wanted to work. So there was that at the, at the top. And then beneath that was a somewhat warped interpretation of what officers actually do in the military, right? I don't come from a robust military family. I've learned most of it as I've gone along. And my initial interpretation was that offices are the guys that sit behind desks and enlisted guys are the guys that actually go out and get their hands dirty and do stuff. Now, that's not entirely 100% accurate, although there's, there's, some, there's some truth to that, right? Um, but I very much wanted to be a worker yeah. and be the guy doing the thing rather than the guy telling the guy to do the thing. It's kind of ironic because, you know, a few years ago, I did transition to warrant officer. So now I am a commissioned officer, Although warrants and traditional offices are, you know, different in nature. So it was really uh, mostly based off of the speed in which I could get into, into Army Soft. Right. So, so what, what inspired you to join then, right? Because I guess, and let's even go before that. Like, so did you grow up in, in the city, like in, in Boston proper or in just in an area or what? Yeah. So I moved as a kid about every 12 to 18 months, I was in a new spot. A lot of that was, was pertaining to my parents and their, and their work life. So I bounced around a lot. Most of the time was spent in, and in, the, in the immediate area of Boston proper. Um, went to high school in Dorchester. Went to college just north of Boston up in Lowell. And to kind of get at your question, it's, I, I, was, I was considering the military in high school. I was actually considering the Marine Corps. And... Like my sophomore year of high school, I skipped class. I went downtown and I met with a Marine Corps recruiter and said, I want to be a Marine. And he said, great, graduate high school and then come talk to me and we'll get you in. So that was like a general plan I had. I didn't have a whole lot of direction. I wasn't an academic. I really disliked school. Athletics was the only thing that really kept me in any kind of positive direction. Mm. And that's ultimately what determined my, my 
decision post high school because I started getting recruited to play football. So that was the only reason why I went to school. If that hadn't happened, I would I almost certainly would have been listed as a Marine right out of high school. Um, came in as, um, let's see, beyond. So I go to college, and then sophomore year was was nine eleven, which. Mm. You know, most of us that were old enough to to know where we were that that day, that moment, we'll never forget it. I'm no different. And, you know, I'll never forget. I was on my way to class and all of the students were kind of walking back towards the dorms. I didn't know what was going on. I stopped. I said, what's up? They said, all, all the classes are canceled today. And I, I was excited. I'm like, well, perfect. This is great. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm mapping out how I'm just going to waste the rest of my day away. And right. I head back to my dorm room, turn on the TV. The same thing is on every channel. And obviously, oh, wow. Okay. And, you know, man, I can remember uh, it, it, to me, it felt like those planes were flying into me. Like I was, I was angry and a lot of yep. us were, right. I was angry and I could see us going to combat because of that. And I wanted to be a part of that. And again, I kind of already had the military in the back of my mind pre-college that became the tipping point for me. So um, I really struggled to stay in school at that point. I, I wanted to get out of college and enlist, but I listened to some mentors and some teachers and some family and, and, uh, and I stayed in and I grinded out the rest of my college time. I earned my degree and then I started looking at options to get in right after that. What's your degree in? Criminology. Oh, wow. Yeah. The, and, and I guess like, you know, I guess what in high school was inspiring you to join then? Like, cause you wanted to get in, you wanted to join, like what, what, if it, uh, 9-11 sounds like a tipping point for you that just affirmed, like, this is what I'm doing. But what was, what was drawing you towards it back then? Because I think you said it wasn't a family thing and you weren't following in any footsteps, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll go kind of, there's really two answers to the question. The first is relatively shallow and it's based off of marketing <coughs> commercials, right? The Marine Corps, to this day, have phenomenal yeah. marketing, right? The uniform, the dress A, it's the best there is. It's by design. And the commercial, this dude, he climbs a mountain. He takes out a sword. He, like, slays this, like, lava dragon monster. And he snaps into the dress uniform. I was drawn to that. Like, these guys are the baddest people on the planet. And I, I want to be one of those. And that kind of leads to the more deeper answer. You know, if I'm going to put myself on the couch for a minute, it's really, you know, I grew up kind of a, a scared, insecure kid that was picked on just about everywhere I went. Because again, like I said, I moved around a lot. I was the new kid every year. And you know, nowadays what's classified as bullying back then was just part of growing up. It was just part of being a kid. It, no one really paid too much attention to it. Yeah. So I was insecure. I lacked confidence. I really wanted to be you know, respected and tough and strong. And the Marine Corps is what gave me that outlet. So that just became the go-to at that point. Right on. Now, did you play youth football or was football like a high school thing? Yeah, I started playing football when I was seven. I Is that right? Real young, yeah. And what, what did you end up playing in high school and then into college? Well, what, position? P position wise, yeah. Yeah, in high school, I was a strong safety, mm. uh, which I loved. And in college, I they moved me to outside linebacker. And it's a funny story because I started getting looked at again my junior year, kind of on the periphery. And it was in between, I want to say it was my junior and senior year of high school. I was real late to the puberty game, right? Real late, which was also a struggle when all my friends have like deep voices and they're getting facial hair. And I'm like this tiny little squeaky voiced mouse running around. In between my junior and senior year, I shot up over that summer like seven inches in height. I mean, it was nuts. I had this crazy growth spurt. And the same <laughs> recruiters that saw me as a junior were now seeing me as this six foot four ish, lanky, skinny, like gangly, kind of awkward athlete. And they're like, what happened to the dude we saw that was, you know, five seven just last year? Um, so I, I managed to maintain my speed and my athleticism. But they saw that, hey, this dude's got an entirely different frame to, for, us, for us to have to work with. So we're basically going to spend the first year or two just teaching him how to train his nutrition and stack on the weight to match the height. And eventually he'll play linebacker for us. And that's ultimately what happened. Right on. Awesome. Now, what, what division did you end up playing in college? D2. D2? Right on. Cool. Yeah. The, uh, and you didn't have any bigger aspirations of football beyond, beyond college? I did. 
Yeah, yeah. I absolutely did. Yeah, I um, you know, I didn't have I didn't have the the skill um to get to that next level. And I, I didn't, I was, again, I was late to the game in terms of my physical development. And I blame, I blame this on my father, you know, jokingly. So my birthday is September 1st, which puts me in this really interesting category of, do you start him in school early or do you wait? Yeah. And I was pushed into, you know, kindergarten at a very young age while everyone else was a year older than me. Yeah. So I started college <laughs> ball at 17 years old. As a freshman in college, I was 17. And most of my classmates were either 18 or 19. So I missed out on a whole year or potentially two, right? Like some states like Texas is kind of big for this where they'll hold students back. So, you know, they graduate college or they graduate high school like 20 years old and they're just animals, right? They get all that time to develop. I was on the opposite of that spectrum. Um, and, I, you know, I'm kind of joking, but I, I didn't I, I was late to the game to build my body up to a point where I even had a physical shot at it. Um, but I also lacked the the work ethic and the discipline and the dedication and the focus that it really does take to make it to that next level. I'd, I'd like to think that if I had the extra year or two to develop my body and I had a similar mentality uh, and way about living my life as I do now, then, then, you know, maybe I would have had a shot. But, you know, man, I had a blast playing the, you know, the time that I did and I'm very happy with the way things turned out. So it's all oh, good. Because how old are you now? 39. Yeah, man. So it's amazing, like that 10 years of life, like the discipline it packs on you. You know, it's it's just wild. It's And it's, I don't know, maybe it is that like, if I knew then what I know now, but just the, the ability to focus and just get laser focused on like an objective and just mm. go get after it. As opposed to when we were the, those kids, whether you're teenage or even 20s, man, like you said, like the college days, it's just hard to get you didn't know what's, what's the right moves. You know what I mean? You know? Yeah. Yeah. How, now, were you, uh, how many brothers and sisters did you have coming up? I have one younger sister. She's two years younger than me. Um, she's still up in Massachusetts. She's got three <coughs> kids. She's unbelievable. Real estate agent takes care of the family, takes care of the house. Um, an unbelievable human being. You know, my first, my first friend. And to this day, one of my best friends. Nice. What, uh, so with regard to, you know, your your career we so you join up now what's special about this 18 x-ray like that's just a fast track to get you in soft and like i hadn't heard of that before you brought it up yeah so it's a program it's uh it, it was instituted originally back during vietnam and then it went away and it came back in 2002 obviously post 9 11 post afghanistan uh and sf knew they needed more bodies so it came back and it just, yeah, it, it speeds up the process. You know, you bypass the conventional army and it, it puts you directly into that pipeline. It's a little bit of a roll of the dice because if you at any point don't make it, and now we're talking about at least, you know, around two years of training, start to finish, including basic training, airborne school, right? Like all the selection. If you go straight through, although nowadays they've streamlined it, but back when I went, that would, it took me. It took me over two years, right, start to finish. Right. Um, at any point, if you if you get dropped because you either fail to perform or you get injured significantly, and they take you out of the pipeline, you go quote needs of the army, which means that they can send you anywhere to do really any job. Um, so it's a bit of a it's a bit of a gamble, right? But I was confident that that I would make it, and I was confident that that's where I wanted to work. So it gave me the speed option, although. Even though I, you know, I went and I had these conversations with the recruiter, I still <laughs> didn't really know what Army Special Forces did. I, mm. I had heard of the Green Berets, you know, like John Rambo and you know John Wayne from the movies, but I really, you know, I knew that they were kind of badasses, but I didn't know what they did. So, you know, I, I went home and just started googling stuff. Like what do what do Green Berets do? What do SFODAs do? Which is the nomenclature for an SF team, and. I was really drawn to what's considered our primary mission set, which is unconventional warfare, a really broad term. When you start to dissect what that actually is, even in unclassified terms, it's enticing. And it was interesting to me. So I was drawn to that. And then I was also drawn to how wide the span of mission sets are that SF teams are expected to execute. Right, A, a lot of elements within the special operations community kind of have these niches, these these specialties. Like this is what they do, this is what they do. And 
the Green Berets is, is that's really, really broad. Where you could easily argue that you know Green Berets really aren't the best at anything. We're just pretty good at just about everything. So you kind of this multi tool. And I, I saw that in my research and I just thought it was interesting. So it, it, it fulfilled what I thought I would want to do once I got there. And it got me there faster. Now in the 18 x-ray, is it, um, cause you were mentioned, cause I'm kind of envisioning like you're going infantry. It, now is the traditional way you're going infantry and then you're being selected for SF. Whereas 18 x-ray, you're like, I'll say pre-selected, meaning you're, you're, is that how, is that the real difference here from a, maybe a traditional path compared to this uh, accelerated path? So pre-selected probably isn't the way to, isn't the way to, 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 to label it. The recruiter, and this can get subjective, does have a, a list of criteria that they're looking for, for who is a viable candidate to be an 18 X-ray, right? Mm -hmm. Your ASVAB score, that's objective, right? You have to score a certain minimum on that test, but then they're supposed to, and let's say that they all do, evaluate the person's physical capability, psychological capability from whatever they can assess, et cetera. Mm. Um, the process for an 18 X-ray is you come into the Army as an 11 Bravo, as an mm. infantryman, right? Mm. So you go to Fort Benning. That's where you do basic. Technically, it's OSIT, one station unit training, because you go right into your AIT all at the same time down at Fort Benning. So you Which come is still out a of, common path, right? Like you're still doing traditional basic, still doing traditional combat yep. training. Okay. Yep. So standardized <clears throat> infantry basic training and standard infantry uh advanced individual training you get done with that and you are classified as an 11 bravo infantryman mm -hmm. and then you just go straight to airborne school and then you go straight to selection and now the pipeline has changed you know 15 times since i went through. as opposed to doing some sort of like infantry mos basically like a as machine gunner to, tanker whatever yeah you go straight so if you yeah okay. an if you commit as an ancient x-ray you're coming in as an infantryman yeah if you go the more traditional route, meaning you're already a service member, you're already a soldier, it doesn't matter what your MOS is. Mm -hmm, so you mm -hmm. don't, if you're an admin clerk, you don't need to go reclassify as an infantryman to then come to SF selection. You, any, any MOS is welcome to go to selection once mm -hmm. you're already in the army. Yep. Right on. The, uh, with regard to what you thought it would be, right? You're talking about doing all this research. I mean, was it, was it what you expected to be or were there any surprises once you got in? There were a lot of surprises when I got in. Yeah, a, a whole host of them, man. Um, you know, I, you come in and, again, I was angry and I wanted vengeance and I wanted to make people pay for what they did. And in my mind, all I was going to do was, you know, kick down doors and shoot terrorists in the face. Like, that was it. That was, that was all I was going to do. And you learn very quickly that that's, that's, that, that's not all you do. Um as a, especially as a Green Beret, right? I will say that, you know, my, my first deployment to Afghanistan, which was about I don't know, six months after I got through the qualification course and got to my team, we were in Afghanistan. And there's a nine month rotation. And I was on a specialized team that, that didn't focus solely on direct action, right? So we were exposed to, or I was exposed to, I talked about that kind of wide array of core tasks and missions. I was exposed to a ton of them on that first deployment. Hmm. And these were experiences that even some of the most seasoned guys that were around really didn't get a chance to do. They just weren't tasked to do that. So I was doing everything from getting up on up armored trucks with 50 cows and machine guns sticking out of them all over the place to go on, you know, an overt type op to being in a soft skin Corolla in civilian clothing driving through downtown Kandahar, right? So mm. it was a, it was just such a wide span of different things that we were doing over those first nine months that I was trying to, you know, drink through a fire hose and, and, yeah. and take all this stuff in. Um, so I, I how learned, long had, maybe you said it, how long were you in before you got deployed on your first deployment? I got through the Q course and then I was in Afghanistan. I think it was maybe six or eight months later. No kidding. Yeah. Um, so like a relatively quick turnaround. Sure. Um, but I, I learned real quickly that there's just a lot more to what we do in this profession than shooting bad guys in the face yourself. Um, so yeah, it, it, it was not 
it was not what I own. It was not what I expected because there was just a lot more going on than what I expected. Sure. Now that said, the the quote, you know, you want to kick in doors and shoot terrorists in the face. That mentality, right? You're rolling in, want to be uh, special forces, but you're not coming from a military family. Like, how's your your mom, dad, sister, like taking this version of you, who's like. Mm. I'm finishing school and I'm going to go kick doors in and shoot terrorists in the face. Like what's mom and dad saying about, about that, Nick? Yeah. Um, you know, petrified. Yeah. Uh, scared. It's funny because I graduated college. I was 24 years old, right? It took me six and a half years to get through college. Right. Gr- again, not an academic grinded through 24 when I graduated or 24 when I, in, when I enlisted and, um, my, I remember telling my father, like, hey, this is this is what I'm going to do. And my father's real close in age to me. He had me when he was like 20. So we're like also really good friends. I'm like, hey, dad, I, you know, I did the research. I met with the recruiter. This is what I'm doing. And his response to me was, no, you're not. And he was dead serious, <laughs> you know, as, as if he was going to like You're 24? Me. That's the 24-year-old you're having this conversation? Yeah, 24, <laughs> just graduated college. And his response was, absolutely not. You're not doing that. As if, you, as if I was, you know, nine years old and he was mm-hmm. going to send me to my room. And it was just, you know, it was out of fear. And I, I can appreciate that now, especially as a father. So, you know, they were, they were nervous. They were scared. And then, you know, we can get into this whenever you want. But obviously, I put them through, uh, you know, the arguably as close to the worst case scenario as it gets with me yeah. still being alive anyway, right? Like that close to death and them having to go through that. So they weren't really excited about it. But obviously, fast forward a few years and – you know, they're both all into the military and they read all the stuff and they speak the language the best they can. And, you know, they're my biggest fans and, uh, you know, they're, they're just amazing people. I love it. I love it. The, uh, and what, so, so yeah, let's, let's dive into it. So walk me through your deployments, what you're learning, what, and I guess like what's changing with you, um, as you're going through this, what, how, how are you changing, you know, as you're going, right. Cause you're coming out of college, right. You know, not an ap- academic or an athlete, you know, but what, how, how's the transition? Like what's the, mm. what's the pre service Nick versus the mm. beginning of service? And like, how are you growing through this? What are you, what are you getting out of it? Man, a, a lot, <laughs> so much Dale pre pre service, right? Like late high school and through most of my college career. Um, you know, I was a bit of a punk. Uh, I mean, if I would put a, put, wrap it up into kind of a single word, right. Um, got in trouble, lack, lack direction. And a lot of that, I kind of talked about growing up as this insecure kind of scared kid, like that lingered for a really even, even long with your time. size, even, even, even when you packed on yeah. size. Yeah. Yeah. Even once I got bigger and stronger. And at this point I'm, I'm boxing, I'm doing MMA and I'm martial arts. Like I'm a bad, I'm a bad motherfucker. Right. But still I just had this, this, this desire to prove myself to other people. And I was concerned about people thinking that I was weak. Right. And we, I don't want to go too far down the psychological rabbit hole because it gets kind of long and deep quick. But I made a lot of really poor decisions, even through college. Uh, and things could have gone left or right, you know, really easily. The military ended up being kind of almost coming full circle back to when I was in high school, kind of my outlet to get me on a positive direction. So that was kind of a major point of growth right there, just getting in. And then starting to recognize the significance of discipline and structure and teamwork and leadership and following uh, a leader, right? And taking orders and hard work, right? So I'm getting this kind of framework, this foundation. And then kind of a second growth point happened because when I came in, like I said, I wanted to come in. I wanted to fight. I wanted to kick ass. I wanted to get some vengeance. But my original plan was to come in, do my first five years, and then get out. Right? Mm-hmm. I was going to take my skills, my experience and take it to another sector of United States government service. That was my plan. Well, that first deployment I mentioned, nine months, mostly in Kandahar in 2011, when things were real hot and heavy, after that trip, actually it was during the trip, about halfway through, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. It was when I really fell in love with the profession. It no longer was a job for me. It was a lifestyle and one that I I wanted to maintain. So I actually re-enlisted right there in Afghanistan for another six years on top of that. Um, So that was kind of transition point, kind of two or three, once I'm already in service. And then, you know, fast forward another year or so, 
to the deployment where I got banged up a bunch of times. And then that obviously was kind of the catalyst for a whole nother kind of trajectory shift. And what does that mean? Like you're talking, uh, getting banged up a couple of times. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, were you just in the thick of it and, you know, minor injuries that ultimately led to, you know, take, dig into that a little bit. Yeah. So my second, my second combat rotation into Afghanistan, this was in 2012. Um, you know, we, we got dropped off into a hornet's nest and it's, it's the mission we wanted. It's the mission all the teams were fighting to get because it was going to be the most kinetic and the most hostile and the highest risk. And that's where SF teams want to be. And we got it and we got exactly what we want. We got exactly what we asked for. And, you know, we've been on the ground 48 hours and then we were in our first engagement and that really didn't stop for five and a half, six months. Mm. So, you know, I was wounded three times um, on three separate occasions on that deployment, took some shrapnel to the back of my shoulder, um, took an AK-47 round to the side of the face. And then the third one uh, was the one that ultimately resulted in, in me losing my leg above the knee. Mm. So, again, like talking about transition points and growth beyond that, right? So at this point, I've already committed to this is a lifestyle, right? I'm not getting out. I'm going to go at least to 20 years. Like I love what I do. I don't want to do anything else other than be a green beret. That was it. Uh, you know, I had that question for you, right? The, like you're getting in the thick of it. You're chopping it up. Like, is there any doubts coming through at any point or you're like, nope, I love this shit. This is what I'm here to do. You know, bring, yeah. bring it. Loved it. Loved yeah. it, man. It was, it was, it was the moment where man, my first deployment was when I fell in love with the profession. So my passion came on board <laughs> and it was on my second combat rotation when I got banged up a bunch of times that my purpose came on board. Like I, mm. I felt like this is why I was put on earth was to do what I'm doing right now. So wow. at that point, I'm dealing with like the ideal one, two punch, right? Passion and purpose all funneled together. And I didn't want to be anywhere else. And it's, it's, it's kind of not for you because you, you've lived the life, but for, you know, your average person to think, you know, you're in a hostile environment, you're getting shot at, blown up, your friends are being killed, you're being shot, you're, it's like a mess. And you're telling me that this is exactly where you want to be. And it's like, yeah, that really is, that really is the truth, you know? Um, but again, at this point, I see myself staying in long term and I'm looking at the next tier of where I can work, right? Like what's mm-hmm. the next step above that? What, how do I get onto, you know, a true elite, the elite of the elite of the elite unit? So now I'm all in. And that was kind of my game plan at that point, right? I'm going to come off. I had it mapped out over the course of another few years after this deployment. I've got that mapped out. Um, and then, you know, what happened on March 11th, 2013, ended up losing my leg. It again, kind of shifted things into, into kind of a new ish kind of direction. And what happened? What, 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 what'd you run into? So the, the circumstances of the day itself, man, I guess the short version, we can extract as much as you want, but it was, we had about two or three weeks left in our deployments. We'd been there about five and a half months and getting ready to do a, a joint operation, which was common for us. We had our own Afghan special forces team that lived with us. Mm-hmm. And then we were also like doing lived with you, with, not just meet up, but you're, you're oh, living they lived together. With us. Yeah. Oh yeah. And this is when we were doing VSO, which stands for village <laughs> stability operations. And the short definition of that is basically you put these teams in these extremely austere environments and you actually prohibit them or limit them from building up any kind of robust infrastructure because the idea was if we build these things too big, when we go to transition and hand it over to our partners, it'll be too big for them to maintain. Like mm-hmm. we're taking it too far outside the way that they really live. So mm-hmm. we, we need to adapt to them. So it makes sense. It puts the team at a super high risk, which again, we loved. So we're in this like blown out camp. There was a, a blown out you know, Soviet tank, like 200 meters from where we were. There had been no one really there just decrepit, caved in kind of clay structures. And we threw in some Constantino wire. We got in some HESCO, built up a little security. And that's kind of what we had. But we had an ANA Afghan National Army SF team that was living there with us. And then we would also do ops with the conventional army, the national police, the local police. And when those guys would come, they would show up the day of, and we developed an SOP, a standard operating procedure where only the leadership from these sections would actually come into our wire, right? Come mm-hmm. into our motor pool. 
and everyone else would stay outside just to limit how many people were around us because it's a vulnerable position to be in. Yeah. Well, on this particular day, uh, leadership comes in and a Ford Ranger pickup truck drives in as well. And I see it. And at the time, I was an 18 Bravo, which are the weapons and tactics guys on the teams. One of the primary responsibilities of the 18 Bravo section is base defense. So I'm the one that my, myself and my teammates created our base defense plan, and I'm witnessing a violation of that. So I'm immediately irritated, and I'm like, okay, I'm at the crossroads. Because do you and think it's a is- trivial thing? Do you think it's just guys not just not following the rules, or did you immediately like immediately recognize it as a threat? It was. Well, it's a it's an interesting question, man, because I do recognize it as a threat because it's a violation of the SOP we develop, which is to mitigate threat. So. The fact that they didn't do what we designed in automatically increases the risk and the threat. Sure. Yeah. So I see that. And I also see that there's a machine gun attached to the back of it. Mm. And I'm like, okay, um, two ways to go, right? One is I address this problem right now. Um, I, I prioritize security. The other option is I address this later through my team leadership who talks to his team leadership, kind of go the diplomatic route, which increases the relationship, right? So it's a delicate balance between those two and they're almost antagonistic of each other. If you're too secure, right, it it decreases the relationship because it demonstrates a lack of trust. If you are too security lax, hey, they may think these guys love us, they trust us, but you're now super vulnerable. So this is the life of an SF guy. This is the life of of an ODA because we only operate with indigenous personnel. So I see this, this happening in front of me. I'm at that crossroads and I decide to wait. I say, okay, I'm going to talk to my team sergeant or my captain after we get back from this thing and he'll deal with it. And again, this brings up a good point, a solid lesson learned. After five and a half months, you become conditioned to a lot of you know, sloppiness that you know, your partner force may go through. And it, it becomes really difficult to fight that urge to be complacent. And even the best of us, are subject to that. And I was in that moment. And, you know, I can justify it all day long and I'm able to sleep at night, but I ultimately decided to wait. And what ended up happening was as soon as we got done with our pre-mission brief, our comps checks, uh, a dude, Afghan National Police Officer, jumped on the back of the truck and opened fire into the crowd from about 15 feet away. A Russian PKM, which is a belt-fed machine gun, Mm. uh, causes a lot of damage at that kind of range. Uh, the result of that was 12 U.S. casualties, including three killed. My team leader was killed. Our infantry uplift squad leader was killed. And our military working dog was killed. Uh, another nine wounded. And then around nine or ten uh, Afghans were killed or wounded as well. So a complete and total mass casualty scenario. Yeah. Most of the damage to me was done to my legs. Uh, I took around four or five rounds to my right leg, which just ripped it to shreds severed my femoral artery, shattered my femur, and I took a round to my lower left leg, which really wasn't much of a problem at that point. Um, kind of speed through it. I was on the ground about 90 minutes before the medevac bird could land. This was because it was an ongoing firefight. Sure. The, the shooter inside our camp, it, w- it was the initiation of a complex ambush. So as soon okay. as he cracked off the gun, we started taking rockets and machine gun fire from outside of our perimeter. So Bird couldn't land for about an, about an hour and a half, uh, gets on the ground, picks me and a couple of my teammates up, gets us to a med location. Um, I need a transfusion really bad. I'm almost out of blood. And they put me on a transfusion with the wrong blood type, which essentially kills me. Uh, right. It shuts down all my organs. They don't know what, wrong, what happened, what the problem was. They put me on another helicopter. They sent me to Bagram. And it was when I was on the flight to Bagram that they realized what happened with the blood. And they're like, there's no way Nick is going to survive this flight. Just be prepared to, to receive his body. And in a lot of ways, they were right. You know, I coded on that flight. I was pretty much done. And uh, they still got me off the bird, threw me into surgery, put me on dialysis, another transfusion. I'm intubated. They hack my leg off below the knee. And uh, I mean, obviously, I'm, uh, I managed to survive, man, because I'm here talking to you. So it, with the sequence of events, you know, you see a, a breach of protocol, uh, SOP, but they played it cool. So it wasn't like, you know, the, the ambush where they just came in and started firing. They 
it was it was a it was a bit baited, right? So it sounds like they were they just played it cool. You guys went through a deep a, a briefing, and then after that is when wow, yeah, yeah, and you know, ideal target of opportunity for them. And you know, the Taliban, and they're not they're not the only ones that have practiced this, but you know, they have a tactic that works, and they re- they realize that someone works alongside us. They have access to them, and they go to them, and they make it very simple. They say, "Hey, man, check it out. Option A." is you do this for us. You're, you're going to die, right? You'll be martyred. They're going to kill you. But this is option A. Option B is we slaughter your entire family right in front of you right now, and then we kill you anyway. So what do you want to do? And, you know, after the fact, once I once I was told what happened, I'm in the hospital, I put myself in that dude's shoes, right? Especially now as a father. If I'm in that predicament, I do the exact same thing. So it, that immediately kind of got rid of any kind of anger or ill will I had towards that individual because that's an impossible situation. And really where the Taliban, just as an example here, um, how they make that work is they actually follow through on taking care of the family of that Mata for the rest of their lives. So they've got a track record of proving sure. and actually following through with what they say they're going to do which is why it works. So, you know, that time, 2011, 12, 13, 14 uh, in Afghanistan, the insider attacks, otherwise called the green on blue scenarios, were our greatest threats because that tactic was so successful. So, I mean, over those years, it really forced teams to re-look at uh, the, our protocols and our SOPs and what we're prioritizing as threats and risks and, you know, be looking inward just as well as we're looking outward and, yeah, it's an impossible task to get right, but you do what you can to, you know, kind of mitigate it. Yeah, it's a it's an impossible situation. From your opinion, man, I just just curious. I mean, is the the anti American sentiment like I, I guess is is it is that a minority? But it's a minority that has the power and the will to conduct themselves in such a nefarious way as you just described. Like, you know, what's, what's the reality? Like, cause you know, you hear things, but what's the reality of being there as far as, you know, I've got this vision that there's, there's a populace that wants our help, you know, but there's a, there's a, a minority that's in power. That's, you know, what's, what's the reality of it? You know, are they crazy, crazy question? I know, but you know, just kind of curious, like, you know, as far as like the people you work with, where they 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 wanted our help and wanna wanna be f- free, or what's the? Yeah, it's 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 a good question, man. And I think that it's safe to say that there's no 100 percent right answer. Um, if I look at this solely through the lens of my experience over there, I spent a lot of time in Afghanistan. I'd say, generally speaking, the the local populace want to live a life of relative peace and they want to raise their families. And most of them um, have very simple aspirations for what, you know, success and happiness looks like. They want to, they want to raise their crops. They want to raise a family. They want to keep them safe and they want to hand over their farm to their kids. And like, that's what life looks like. Um, In a lot of ways, it's kind of tough when you come from the West and we've got, you know, Instagram and podcasts and, you know, Starbucks and like all this stuff. It's normal for us. And you spend some time in some real kind of austere, uh, you know, almost like backwards time, like prehistoric conditions where it takes a minute to even wrap your mind around, oh, this is really how you live. Like you're, yeah. you're living in a house made of the ground and you're totally okay with that, right? Like, do you not know what else is out there? Which could actually be the case. With right. some tribes in some locations, they literally don't know, or they do, and they're like, "Yeah, but this is just how we live. This is this is our culture, right?" So I think again, most just want to live that life of kind of peace and solitude, and I think that they're put oftentimes in between a rock and a hot spot, where it's, "Are you going to agree to support whatever that looks like?" Um, you know, NATO, the Americans, whoever's over here that's that's here to help us. If I do that, what does that do to my risk from these other individuals that have more guns than I do and more people than I do? Um, or do I support these this militia, this gang, this organization, this whatever you want to call it, 
Um, and the Americans and their big trucks and all their machine guns, they keep showing up here and they're like, hey, they're asking me these questions. Like, it's a really difficult position to be in, you know? So you, I don't think there's a right answer for them. Um, yeah. They've gotten a lot of practice at it, right? We were over there 20 years. Um, and, you know, it's also very regionally based, man, depending on where you go, north, south, central, uh, the sentiment and the cultures do shift depending on mm. where you go. So sure. again, I don't think that there's a, a clear cut black and white answer to the question from our perspective or from this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and we're, we're not going to jump into politics, but, but th- all this divisiveness that we see, the kind of like the basis of my question, I, I've found my experience and kind of like why I asked that was I try to tell people, I go, look, man, you got to realize, like, I feel like a majority of us and I go like 80, 85% of people just want life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? Like all this, this shit that we hear, this divisiveness, polarization, whatever. I say, you know, when you talk to real people, like the general populace, I don't care where you're from, what you do. Like, I feel like a majority of people I meet, know, come across along the way or there, right? They just want life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And they, like you said, they just generally want a, a peaceful, I'll go so far to say loving a purposeful existence, mm-hmm. you know? Um, yeah. And I, you know, I just want to bring that up because I think like, I just always, every opportunity, I want people to hear that reminder, man, like, you know, just step aside sometimes and just realize like, we're all human beings, like living a, living the thing, you know, and, and, but the majority of people sure. you're ever going to meet just want that life, liberty and pursuit of happiness, you know, regardless of color, race, religion, <laughs> party, whatever, you know, like, mm-hmm. so, um, anyways, the, so you're on the, on the flight are you are you conscious do you know what's going on do you know how severe it is are you dipping in and out like what's Mm. going on with you at this point yeah uh you know the initial medevac bird i I knew how serious it was because i knew my femoral lottery was severed um i treated myself um out of the gate and throughout that that initial response uh so i knew the severity of it in fact i i was convinced i also knew I didn't think I knew I was dying right there. Mm. I knew there was no question about it. Right. The amount of blood that was pumping out of me was like, okay, there's there's only so much of that in you and you're going to continue to lose it unless you're able to get a clamp on the artery itself, which isn't happening anytime soon. So we're pretty much done here. So I get in that first bird and, and you know, one of my teammates that loaded me on, they said their goodbyes to me and, and back to them. And uh, I'm like in and out of consciousness, but I remember, I'll never forget that moment. I don't think my heart has ever been filled with that much pride and love ever before. Um, And then once I'm, once I'm flying, I'm kind of in and out. Right. And then they stop putting meds on me. So I'm really fading. And then it's just kind of, it's just kind of flashes of memories going from one aid station to the next. Uh, I was in Afghanistan for five, six days total post injury so that they could stabilize me enough to survive a flight to Germany. Okay. Uh, which eventually yeah, I, I, was did. Curi- I was curious how soon they got you to Germany. So you were, you were treated in country for a week almost. Yeah. yeah just, just under a week. Uh, cause they, they, I was, I was hooked. The only thing keeping me alive were all the machines I was on. So they're like, we okay. can't put this guy on a plane. He's, he'll, he'll, he won't live. Got me stable enough. Um, got me to Germany. I was there for just a night, I believe day or maybe two. And they took my leg up to the knee at that point. And really, they were fighting infection. That was the that was the concern. You know, when you're on the ground in a place like Afghanistan, not exactly the cleanest place in the world, with a severely open wound for that amount of time, you know, bacteria and fungus. And just I had just about everything you could think of growing in my leg, like a petri dish. Mm-hmm. And so they were they were just started chasing the infection that's really yeah. became that became the biggest risk to me to include once I finally got to Walter Reed. Yeah. What, where, where, what do you, are you, are you still, are you still a single guy at this point? You're not married or any of that yet. Right. You're, you're single guy, single FF guy, SF guy doing your thing. We didn't, I, I didn't, um, I was, I was married prior to my current wife. Um, <clears throat> so I was married to my, ex-wife at the time oh, yeah okay so you're um wh- where are you at like at this point like what do you, you you know you've lost your leg now you survived the the blood tran- transfusion thing was that like while you're in afghanistan that that's they were able to get that squared away or was that still a problem even up through germany 
Yeah, they were able to get the blood situated at Bakra. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so what's what's psychologically what's what's going on? Like, are you thankful to be alive? Are you distraught about the leg? Like, where do you what are you going through at this point? Because like things things have changed in a big way for you at this point. Mm, yeah. <laughs> when I'm in Afghanistan, I'm in you know the ICU, and they're trying to keep me alive and then stabilize me to fly me to Germany. My thought was I was going right back to the team. It was just crazy. I didn't know the extent of my injury. I knew it was bad, certainly <clears throat> worse than the first two two times I'd been banged up. But I had almost in a way been conditioned to being wounded, eventually getting medevaced, getting treatment, and then going right back to the boys. And that was what I thought was going to happen. Did like, you still have your, but you didn't have your leg at that point below the knee, or did you? I was missing my, my foot at that point. Okay, okay. I was missing my foot, which I don't think I totally understood. Sure. Um, it was just, okay, I'm in the hospital again. I'm going to get out of here in a little bit of time, and I'm going to go right back to the guys. Right. It wasn't until I got to Walter Reed, and I'm in the intensive care unit there, that I really started to grasp the severity of it. Right. And when you're in the hospital and your mother and your father and your sister are there and they're all wrapped up masks in the whole, you know, level five suit, uh, it like dawns on you like, oh, this is actually kind of serious. OK. You know, I I had heard like amputation at some point, but I'm like, OK, yeah, whatever. It doesn't really mean anything to me. Like things are kind of feeling real. And then my doctor comes in. He was the chief of ortho, still one of my closest friends today. He comes in. I only been in Walter Reed, I think like a day. And he's like, Hey man, this is me. Uh, here's the deal right now. Your leg is gone up to your knee and your leg is riddled. What's left of your leg is riddled with bacteria infection and it could actually kill you. Um, and that's what we're trying to mitigate right now. My staff, they want to take you into the operating room down the hall right now. And they want to amputate your leg at the hip and just get rid of the problem and then get you moving on with life. He's like, that's the safe bet. That's the that's the safe move for us to make right now. But I think I can save more of your leg. It's just going to be a knockdown, drag out street fight. And I need you in the fight with me because it's going to suck. And, and I just met this dude. And he's like telling me that this infection in your leg could kill you. But I want to try to keep more of your leg. Like, what do you want to do? And I'm like, well, I think we should do that. And he's like, okay, cool. That's what we're going to do. So then began kind of my three or four days a week surgical regimen where they would just go in, cut out the infection, amputate a little higher, pump me full of antibiotics, you know, rinse and repeat day after day, week after week, up until I had 30 some odd surgeries on my leg, mm -hmm. getting the infection under control, leaving me with what I have today, which is about a four inch FEMA. So, you know, this, the, what I'm thinking uh, it was it was a bit of a journey, but it was really condensed, man, because I went from this point of being like, I will be back with the team in a week. And then fast forward just seven, eight days, my doctor's like, you could die right now. And I'm like, oh, well, let's not let that happen. But also, I want you to save my leg. And he's like, cool. Now I don't know what's going on. But I'm also whacked on ketamine and Dilaudid. And I'm on a whole bunch of cocktails. And I'm in surgery every other day. Right. So I don't really have an opportunity to fully grasp what's going on. Mm. And then once I get off, once the surgeries start to die down and I'm weaning off these drugs, you know, so fast forward four or five weeks beyond that, it's like, okay, your leg is gone. Most of it, you have only this little kind of piece left. Um, what are you going to do? And right there and then, dude, I decided kind of back to where I began was I'm going back to the team. I, I don't know how or if it's even possible, but as it stands right now, that's the mission and let's stop moving in that direction. And that's a you versus you conversation. You're going, I'm going back. How, how are we going to get there? Like you're, that's, that's your new mission. Like you, you go from get through this, your doc rallies the troops, so to speak with you going, Hey man, we want to save as much your leg needs you in this fight with me. You're getting, you're going through that. And, and now you're through, you're done. You got the infection you saved a, how just above your knee, right? That's where you end up stopping with that, with the, with the, as far as your yeah, like way, yeah. way above the knee. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh yeah. My femur is four inches long, um, which is super short and it's even 
considered shorter, which sounds weird, but when you're six six like I am, it just increases the length the prostate sure. has yeah. to be. So it just makes it a little bit more challenging. Okay. So yeah, because you're seeing pictures of you, it looks like you've got just like an above the knee amputation, but is that not so you've actually got prosthetic above the knee and, and is that what's attaching to the the from the knee on down? So yeah, my 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 residual limb, which is the the proper way to say stump. Apparently, I didn't know this, but stump is like an offensive term to some people. I can say it because I'm talking about myself. Um, <laughs> right. right, my stump, my residual limb, four inches femur, um, no quad recept, no hamstring. Right, infection ate both of those muscles, mm. so I only have a couple small little muscles in there. Um, adductor, abductor, right, like lateral and medial muscles, the tiny. And that's it, bone, tissue, and it's not a whole lot to work with. I think it's safe to say that I've been left with just enough to operate as an above-the-knee amputee yeah. as opposed to a hip disarticulation. Daddy. Sure. Hang on. Yeah, buddy. Look, I have an anatomic. Awesome. Did you make that? Cool. Hey, can I finish up this phone call? This is an anatomic. Yep, come on. Okay. I love it, dude. Yeah, I'm going to come check it out more in a minute. <laughs> Sorry, man. My four-year-old. It's all good. It's all good. I kind of figured that may happen. Yeah, I know. Um, so, yeah. And, and what I like to point out, which I was I was ignorant to until I went through the process, is it, it's really not the loss of the limb that makes the difference. It's the loss of the joint that makes mm. the difference. Because we can replicate a tibia and a fema really easy nowadays. It's the ankle, yeah. knee, and hip that we just haven't quite figured out how to replace as great as the one that we had when we entered this earth. So every joint you lose just increasingly compounds the difficulty that you have to go through to remain as functional as you once were. So again, the doc, his staff, hip disarticulation, that was plan A. He decided and was willing to fight it out to keep me as an above the knee. Um, and although you know I'm confident with my abilities and I do believe that, you know, anything is possible and all that stuff. If, if they had done what they wanted to do initially, I, it's safe to say it's as close to impossible as it gets for me to still be doing, you know, what I'm doing now. Yeah, so to say I'm right. grateful for, you know, my friend, my doctor would be a drastic understatement. Yeah. Well, it's like the, you know, the losing two joints versus three and, and kind of how you're explaining it. Right. Cause if you went all the way to the hip, now you, you're, you're, way more severely de debilitated than not and then yeah. where, where your situation so was there yeah. mentally were you were you ever faced with just the despair that you know that of your situation or or were you just locked in going hey i'm, I'm coming through this I'm, I'm getting back to the team so were you ever did you ever face depression or anything like that you know i didn't and uh and i'm delicate when i answer this because you know, it's not something I'm proud of, which sounds weird. But I reason why I say that is because if that were to happen, it's also not something to be ashamed of. Sure, yeah, right, at all. It's almost expected, and it's it's almost part of the process. Yeah, I, I never went down that road. Um, and as much as I, you know, kind of think on it and reflect and analyze, like, hey, you know, how was I able to stay not positive all the time? Because there were times that I was frustrated and angry and pissed. Right. It wasn't like this kittens and rainbows thing all day, sunshine all the time. Um, but how was I able to avoid, you know, going down a really dark, nasty road? And even though I was angry at times, uh, I was able to keep moving in this direction. And the best thing to come up with is, again, I was conditioned to being wounded. So I was familiar with it. I was conditioned to getting past that, even though we're talking about wildly different in severity. But still, like been blown up, been shot, shrapnel, you can get past that and you can still be an asset. Um, and then you, we started off, you started off, you just said, you know, it was kind of you versus you and it was, right? So kind of my competitive instincts that go back from when I was a kid, my stubbornness, right? My time as an athlete, my desire to not just win, but not lose, right? Two different things. These, This is what's funneling in my head. And I'm like, you know, Bottom line, no one's going to determine my future but me, right? And I was going to make you pay for thinking that you could dictate my future. And that that's, that's, I think, how I was able to stay on the track to getting back so quickly um, 
because I, I didn't see any other option as anything that was on the table, right? Like yeah. there was no plan B. This, yeah. this is going to happen. I just got to figure out how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's awesome. And that's why, I, because and that's why I asked the question, because I wasn't hearing that. Like, I'm not hearing like you were like Anna Funk and someone, you know, none of that. Like you're, you're just like, you're on to the next mission. You know, you're, you're just, you're just victory after victory. And you're just hyper-focused on, you know, where do I go from here? Where am I going from here? Where do I want to be from here? So I, 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 I asked it kind of in honor of that because I think it seemed like pretty, mm. pretty special that you were kind of just here to endure, like to, to get to that, to where you want to be. Um, so yeah, where, where do you go cool, from? There's actually a cool story, Dale. Let me tell you. Yeah, shoot it. My father tells it better than me because he was there by, by my side for the first like six months I was in the hospital. And part of Walter Reed <clears> is kind of the whole wellness approach. So you're meeting with every specialist you could think of. It's like a revolving door coming in your room. One of that are the mental health docs and the psychologists. They come in, they check up on you. And it drove me crazy. I'm like, doc, I'm fine. Get away from me. He's like, no, like we're going to talk. This is part of the process. I'm like, okay. So we talked three, four, five different times. And I'm telling him, hey, man, I'm going back to my unit. I'm going back to my team. I will be back in Afghanistan conducting combat here at some point. And he's like, cool. Yeah, obviously he's like supportive of that. At one point, he pulls my father aside by himself. And he says, hey, dad, check it out. I don't think Nick really has grasped the severity of his situation because he's talking about going back to Afghanistan and like doing all this like crazy stuff. Um, I just want you to be aware and prepared for that moment where the light bulb kind of clicks on and he realizes that, re that that's not really a practical option and he may likely go down this kind of nasty, depressed road. And I want you as his kind of support here to be ready for that. And my father is like, hey, Doc, I appreciate, you know, um, the heads up and I hear what you're saying. I, I just, I don't think that that's what's happening. I think he does get it. Um, I just think he's kind of locked into his head on what he's going to do and he's not seeing anything other than that. So, you know, obviously I'll keep an eye on it. Thank you very much. And you know, that's, that's kind of the way it ended up playing out. So even, even the mental health docs that were there were like, yeah, this dude's kind of, you know, almost at that tipping point, but like, when's it going to happen? It, it just didn't, it just didn't happen, which, right. you know, again, it's kind of cool. Yeah, it is. And you know, he's, he's trying to, you know, call the, you know, call attention to the, uh, what he's seeing as a, uh, a, a mental health kind of trigger, like, Hey, he's not seeing reality. He's, you know, whatever. And no, that's, that's awesome. What, uh, you know, what, so if it wasn't mental, like what was the biggest challenge through all that? process for you that you had to overcome? It's tough to say the biggest, uh, cause there were just so many, but the one that comes to mind, uh, this, the soonest when I'm asked that question or something similar is having to accept the fact that no matter how much time I spent in the gym or how advanced of a prosthetic I was given, I was not going to be as physically dominant as I was with two legs. Right. And again, we've talked about a lot of this, like I grew up an athlete. I grew up, you know, wanting to be this big alpha tough guy, I spent time in the boxing ring, like my body and my physical characteristics became my coat of armor that protected me from feeling bad about myself. And I didn't want to go back down to that place because I did it and it sucked. So I identified as this physical, capable human being. Right. I'm like 80 percent brawn, 20 percent brain. And uh, fortunately, I was able to to accept that relatively quickly. But the, the time period it took to get to that point was tough. Right. Like, oh, man. OK, this is the new reality. So, again, I, I'm on my mission. I then had to kind of take a step back and give it like a 30,000 foot view and say, if the mission is to get back to the team and I know I'm not going to be able to do what I did physically, at least not to that same level. How can I still be an asset to the unit, to my teammates, to the mission, whatever? And really started to dissect. We talked again at the beginning of this about, you know, Green Berets and SF teams and how many things they're expected to do and kind of that multi-tool. I began to just extract these different skills and hone in on them. Like, okay, I can, I can, I can get better at this. I can learn this. I can learn this. And began investing a ton of bandwidth, you know, time and energy into those facets of being a special forces operator. The, the reality is, is I, I disliked 
all of that stuff. I didn't want to be spending time learning culture and foreign language and targeting and intelligence gathering and fusion, like all these like softer side of our business was nothing I wanted to do, nothing I was good at, right? I came in again to kick down doors, shoot bad guys in the face. And that's what my team wanted me to do. And it was a win-win, but I saw that I needed to make up the gap between what I was going to lose physically. Um, so one is accepting the fact that that's my reality. And then once you take it a step Baba, it's the discipline um, and determination to invest in these things that you dislike almost operating, or actually I'd say literally operating on blind faith that it's going to pay off, right? Faith being the, the belief in something for which there is no proof. Like I didn't know that if I spent, you know, 40 hours this week learning this thing, it was going to matter, but I believed that it would matter. So I did it. And over time, you know, that compounded and to kind of just come full circle. Once I did get back to the team and I was back in Afghanistan as an amputee in 2015, I was actually able to employ a lot of these different skills that I had invested in all the way back to when I was at Walter Reed. And it kind of just, you know, gave me that sense of, Hey, you know what? You thought that this would work and you know, it, it kind of did, you know, which, yeah. which is pretty special. You know, what I'm hearing you say is like, you had to pivot, right? You've always been someone who chased your potential, you know, especially at, at least from the point of, I, I don't know, I, I definitely from your time of service on, right. You, you recognize that you're chasing your potential and now you know, following your surgeries or whatever, you realize, you just realized you had a, a new set of potential to attain, right? Like you, you were, you were on this line and Hey, now you're on this line. So how far can you go now that you're, you're on this path? So does that, does that make sense? Yeah. And you know, it, it, you just have to play kind of the, the wordsmithing game because you could one easily say, I kind of re, I kind of redefined myself in a lot yeah. of ways. Yeah. But I'd say, you know, more accurately, I just kind of modified and enhanced it because it's not like I gave up lifting weights and running and swimming and shooting. Right. I just knew I needed to add uh, more and different sure. things. So yeah. it was more about creativity and innovation and opening up an aperture and my perspective rather than, you know, redefining myself. It was just you got 24 hours in a day. You know you need to do your physical therapy. You need to get bigger, faster, stronger. You need to still be able to shoot, move, communicate, like tactical stuff. But we've decided we also need to do this stuff. And that was really through that was how I modified my relationship with my strategy and structure and focus, right? And time prioritization and sacrifice, like all these tenants that kind of get thrown around real easily. Yeah. But because I was so obsessed with reaching that goal, I was able to actually execute it, arguably to the first time in my life, you know, at that level, and then see what that looks like kind of on the back end, which, you know, it gives you that perspective, man, on the value of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean yeah, you're right. It's all, all the typical things you hear, like you had a vision and there was no, nothing to stop you but you, except for you, you were going to have to do what you had to do. And that, that was going to be a bunch of things that you necessarily didn't enjoy, didn't mm. didn't see yourself doing. But to yeah, no, I, I get it. I think it's awesome. The, so what I guess the big question I have is what was the challenge in getting back to the teams? Because was, was there a was at this point, right? Because we're talking from 2013 to 15, this journey before till you get back to the team, like <clears throat> Were you, was there a path for you, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. was there a path in the army to be an amputee and get back to service at this point? Cause you know, obviously in that time frame, we're, we're 10 years in this war, right? So mm -hmm. IDs, amputees like that, it, it, unfortunately, like commonplace in this war, you know, for, for that, even that first 10 years was, were, was there a program to get you back or were you leading the way here on that? Yeah, um, th there was in a lot of ways in terms of staying in the military. I am by no means the first amputee to do that, right, mm. by any stretch. As you as you progress, and I, I'm looking to actually get back onto a SF detachment and go back into combat into Afghanistan, that's where the funnel kind of started to get much more narrow. Sure, right? yeah. And even from the very beginning, um, I got buddies that I was at Walter Reed with 
that are conventional military guys, Navy, Army, Marines, amputees, and they wanted to stay in and continue their career in service. And they were they were not allowed to, to do that. Right. They, yeah. were, they were forced to retire. And that has always irritated me. It's kind of on my list of missions to get more involved in because I think our policies are wildly outdated um, since technology and medication have advanced light years and we're still going off of some of this stuff from like pre-Vietnam era. It's insane to me, but we're just losing so much talent and so much potential. Um, I was obviously able to do that. It's like, well, how were you? Well, it's obviously the physical and the training and the mentality, but there's the administrative side that we have to also look at because that was also a street fight. And the, the kind of the cold reality is, and this isn't across the board, black and white, but you know, the military is a business at the end of the day. It's, it's a business and they're looking for a return on their investment, just like any business does. And when you look at members of special operations, for example, they look at how much time and money and effort has been put into building that individual up in terms of skill set and capability. And how long would it take us to replace that, right? It's more based on that than really it is on the kind of humanitarian side where we should let this person stay because it's the right thing to do, yeah. right? Um, and I understand that. And that's okay. It, just, it frustrates me because I got friends that, that didn't have the option that I had. Um, so in the beginning, yes, there's a pipeline, there's a process, there's a way to go about doing it. I kind of had to modify mine pretty early on because I was going through a medical evaluation board, which is essentially designed to get you out of the army or get you out of the military. It's more of a transition board than it is an evaluation board, <clears throat> which I also understand because most of the people that these, that these people work with are looking to get out. So they place a lot of emphasis on that. When you got a guy like me who's missing almost his entire leg and says, hey, I want to go back to being a Green Beret on a team. They're like, yeah, that's not going to happen. Let's worry. Let's get you out of the Army. So, you know, a lot, of, a lot of back and forth and a lot of memorandums and paperwork I'm having to pull together and, you know, just refuse to accept no. Once I was able to be retained in service, then began kind of my next challenge, which was much more narrow in terms of how many people had even attempted it. And that's to go back to the team, right? So, I came back, I began working as an instructor, did that about eight months and decided I was going to, I wanted to take a shot at getting back to the team. And I didn't know what that entailed. And I made it known to my leadership. I said, I want to go back to the team. I feel like I'm ready. And they said, okay. And they just kind of started throwing stuff at me, right? Like different assessments and tests. Mm. And, you know, my commander would be assuming an enormous risk by putting a one-legged guy back on the same team I had come off of, which was a direct action team and was set to go back into Afghanistan just in the, in a few months from that point. Would be an, assuming an enormous risk. So rightfully so, they threw the kitchen sink at me. Physical assessments, cognitive assessments, um, psychological assessments. I mean, at one point, people literally thought I was out of my mind because I couldn't see or hear anything other than this is what's going to happen. And I eliminated everything else from my life. It was it was somewhat somewhat reckless at times, um, certainly obsessive. Um, and at the end of all that, you know, I did basically an assessment or two every week for 12 weeks and got to the last one. And, you know, I said, Hey, wait, what else do you guys want me to do here? And they're like, you know what? Yeah. You've, uh, you've shown us what we need to know and your orders will be cut tomorrow and you'll be back on the team. And then okay. you know, about a month or so later, I was, I was back in Afghanistan. And that was almost really where the real learning began. Like I made it to the top of this ridge line, Dale, and you know it's like high fives and sp spraying beer on, on my boys and celebrating. And then you hit the boots down in Afghanistan, and it's like, oh man, I have so much I still need to learn. Right? Yeah. Like I'm at the <laughs> I'm at the bottom of a new mountain. Yeah, hundred. So same question, different time. How were your parents with that? You know, right? We talked before, like your parents, like no way you're not going. Cool. Now you you. You're an amputee going, I'm going back over there. How, how are they at this point? Are they supportive or are they still like, Nick, what are, what are we doing here, man? Like, what are we doing? Yeah. <laughs> supportive for sure. Um, yeah, sure. hundred percent supportive. Not all that surprised uh, at this point, yeah. you know, like at least that I, this is what my intentions were, but having talked to them as well as teammates and command that were all supportive of me 
at the time, just about everybody, I should say just about nobody thought that this would actually happen at some point, right? Yeah. Like eventually we're going to ask this dude to do something that he can't do, or he's going to realize that, you know, this isn't what he wants anymore and he's going to kind of snap out of it or whatever. Most people in my life at that point thought that that's where this was going. And once it actually got to that decision point and it was like, Oh wow, we actually have to decide if we're going to put this guy back on the team. <laughs> my parents also had to kind of decide like, what, like, what, what do we do about this? Like this dude's out of his mind, but we also know how much he loves it. Um, so they weren't surprised. It certainly it brought back the same fear and concern, but really, man, you know, me as a two legged guy versus me as a one legged guy, like my mother's going to be petrified for six months when I'm in Afghanistan, no matter how many limbs I have. All right. Yeah. Same with my father, same with all my friends and family. So, I mean, it, it really didn't change things all that much. It just kind of kept the same, you know, level of concern that you have for, you know, for your kid. I, I, yeah, man, I love it. Like, I, lo- I love the relentless, like, mission focus. What? I, so, talk to me. I know you've done a lot of stuff on like that warrior mindset. Like, what's the what's the warrior mindset to you? Like, what? what you know? What yeah, is man. Uh, so, to, to not to go too in depth, man. It's it's just kind of the the framework that I've used, where I've taken the warrior ethos and use that as a model to demonstrate the different mental tenets or principles that I found to be important for me when I was going through the process of getting back to the team and continuing to, to do what I do to this day, you know, obviously on, on one leg, right? So, you know, looking at what that is, um, I'll always place the mission first. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. I'll never leave a fallen comrade. And, you know, you mentioned the book early on. I kind of used that model uh, to, to extract the mentality, the mindset side of the house and just use that as, as a way to kind of organize it uh, before then moving quickly into the strategy and tactics behind how do you actually take that and, and make something real of it. Yeah. And um, I think that that's important because there's, there's so much stuff out there, great stuff that I've learned so much from on the importance of mindset and mentality and you know, what you're thinking about, how you focus and channel your thoughts Super, incredibly important. But I also think it's equally important to take that conceptual level stuff and bring it down to the ground where someone can say, okay, I understand the importance of focus and structure and discipline, but what does that really mean for me as a mailman or a soldier or a consultant or a small business owner? Like I'm I'm waking up tomorrow at 6 a.m. What is that like? What does that turn into in three dimensional reality? Um, so with the project again, I didn't want to. I didn't want to just leave it there at that at that kind of warrior mindset level. I wanted to dig in deeper, and really, again, this was just this is anecdotal. This is from what I've been through, what I experienced, um, just to to give that to the next person who is struggling to identify a goal or struggling to overcome the adversity that is between them and the goal. And, you know, just take the lessons learned that I've been through and, and try to try to mitigate some of that, some of that downside. Yeah. And, and it's important because, you know, you know, I talk about this offline, like everyone, everyone has some, some battle to fight, you know, there, there, there's, a, we're all fighting some sort of battle, whether, you know, it's sim- as simple as someone trying to get in shape or all the way up through to someone who's lost a limb trying to get back to their team. Right. Um, we've in, so these, it, you're, but you're right. The mindset has to be there to get started. And then you've got to constantly like test that mindset. Like you got to like tactically, you got to keep testing it, refining it and and getting through it. Cause you can, you can think yourself, think about this stuff all day long from a mindset perspective. But like once, once, you know, pardon the analogy, but once bullets start flying, you got to be able to maintain and persevere through mm-hmm. it, through the suck, the tactics, right. Mm-hmm. The, the, the operation of it, you know, so I, I think it's, it's really important. And, and I love that you mentioned like mission first and cause I, that sings to me from, you know, Marine Corps primary leadership objective is mission accomplishment, secondary is troop welfare. So talk me through like why, why that made the cut for you as far as like mission first. Yeah, man. It, what I love about it at first is it's got <laughs> just such a strong kind of military tone. Um, 
And then to be able to take that and kind of translate it to, to your average civilian and non-military personnel, because you just said it, like everybody has a mission, right? Everybody has a dream or um, an ambition, right? A, a vision of themselves doing something else or doing something better or being someone different or whatever. Everyone's a strong word, but I do believe everyone has that. I would even take it a step farther to say that I believe everyone wants to be great at something. Right. Uh, whether that's a job or a skill or craft or a relationship. I want to be a great parent. I want to be a great spouse. I believe everyone wants, truly wants to be great at something, whether or not we have the self-awareness and honesty to, to accept that. Because even just doing that puts yourself out there. It makes us vulnerable to say, man, I really want to be great at this, but do I have what it takes to execute on it and do all the things that's going to, be required to make that a three-dimensional reality. Um, I don't know if my pride and ego is ready to go down that road. So I'm going to keep that buttoned up and I'm going to lie to myself and say, no, I, I, I want to do exactly what I'm doing right now when really mm -hmm. it's bullshit. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, placing the mission first um, has that tone, but it applies to everybody. And then when you then start to dig into what that actually means, man, at the very beginning, it's, at one of your tenets, clarity, right? Do we have clarity into what the goal actually is? Have we identified what it is? We talked about self-awareness, honesty, and and those are critical, right? Because especially today's world, what we project and how concerned we are about people's perception of us and forgetting all that and having that honest, no bullshit conversation with ourselves. What do I want to do? Who do I want to become? And identifying that is absolutely critical and step one, because if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. It doesn't matter how fast you get there. It doesn't matter how many obstacles you blow through. You can arrive and you're like, eh, this really isn't what I want to be doing. Um, I just went through all that hell to get here. So it's like, it's like doing land navigation, man. Before you take off through the wood line at 100 miles an hour at midnight, plot your point, triple check, quadruple check your point to make sure that it's really where you're trying to get to, because if it's not, it doesn't matter how successful you are at reaching it, you're in the wrong place. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, hundred yeah. percent. That all said, the question I had written for you, you know, with the, with the warrior, warrior por portion of this, you know, you hear this question all the time, are, are leaders born or leaders made? Like are warriors born mm -hmm. or are warriors made? I think, I think great warriors are born. Um, and what I mean by that is I think that they have uh, inherent skill, otherwise known as talent, mm -hmm. that is in line with that. And they have the sense of purpose attached to it, meaning they have the feeling that this is why they were put on, on the earth. Yep. Right? I think great warriors have those. Um, and you look back, you know, through time, one of the ones I, I look up to is Hector of Troy, right? Which mm. kind of has a bad rap because of what happens in, in the movie Troy with Brad Pitt who drags him behind a chariot. But if you actually look into it, and I love Greek mythology, it's, you know, he was, he was the champion of all champions, right? I mean, the ultimate problem solver, the ultimate family man, and a phenomenal tactician and a phenomenal fighter, right? And the guy was born to be a warrior, and Lita, and that's what he did. And so I think to be great, um, you do have to have some of that built within you. Now, saying that, I am a huge believer and advocate of skill over talent, right? Sca talent being something that we do best with the least amount of effort, kind of genetic skill, um, and then skill being earned through hours and thousands of hours of hammering on a craft. I think there's more value in the skill side of the house. So do I think anyone can be one? Yes, uh, because I really dislike limitations really across the board. Um, but to be truly great, I don't think it's based on how accurate you are with a rifle or your ability to swing an ax into somebody's face. It's about having the purpose um, within your soul that pulls you in that direction is what makes warriors great warriors.
Yeah, absolutely. The um, that's a you know, it's great. Uh, Angela Duckworth's Grit. You ever were read or heard of that book? Like she talks yeah. about just the the, the combination of uh, a passion and perseverance. Um, you know, when when I hear people talk about that, it's a uh, you know, it always sings out because she really talked good about that. And uh, David Fico did another great book on um, on grit as well, growing your grit. But so so talk to me about your book. What do you, what you know? What what's it about? Why'd you write it? You know. What's it about? It's about a lot of what we've been talking about here. Um, why I write, why I wrote it, kind of answers the answers the question best. I guess it, the short version is if you go back to like 2019, right? So uh, I, my first deployment as an amputee was 2015. Now four years has gone by. I've done multiple other rotations. Uh, I'm getting more into the public um, interviews and social media stuff, which was was and still is a struggle um, to be accepting of, but more and more people are reaching out to me, uh, through social platforms, email, whatever, almost all, or many of all asking relatively the same question being, how did you do what you did? Which is something we've talked about. How Mm -hmm. did you do it? Right. I'm a new amputee or I tore my ACL or I'm being med boarded from the air force and I want to stay in. Right. Like it was just the how, 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 and it's flooding in hundreds and then thousands and I'm answering the same question repeatedly. I'm like, at one time I say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to document this thing into a Word doc just so I can hit copy, paste, you know, file, attach, send, and just speed up this process. And then you put a little bit more thought into it to give people the answer that they deserve. So it was probably based on efficiency. And I did that. And it turned into like a 15, 17 page Word doc, Microsoft Word, nothing fancy. And I just kind of outlined kind of a guide. And I just, I thought about it. I referenced my journals and I said, what was I doing? How did I do it? And boom, 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 boom. Done. End up using it the way I planned on using it. And then, you know, mid 2020 happens. So about a year later and we're in the peak of COVID and people are teleworking and the world's gone crazy and no one knows what to do with their hands because they got all this time. I was in the same boat, even in the military, we were doing a lot of remote working, which was bizarre, but um, <laughs> I got all this extra bandwidth. So I kind of go back to that guide and I just kind of kept adding more and more stuff. And that turns out as crazy as it is to accept, I actually really enjoy writing, which mm. I would have never thought three years ago, uh, but I do. It's therapeutic and it kind of helps me. It, it, it kind of feeds my analytical mind. Right. Like I'm a I'm a student of psychology. I'm a practitioner of philosophy. So, you know, I ask a lot of questions and I answer them and I just kind of start writing. So I'm doing that. And this guide is kind of growing. And around May time frame, one of my best friends, we've been friends 20 years, played football in college together. His mother's been in the book industry her whole life. He calls me up and says, hey, dude, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I'm like, no. And he's like, well, I think you should. And I'm like, okay, like about what? He's like, you tell me. But like, I think you need to do this. And I'm like, get out of here. And like, I hang up and whatever. And, but then he's, <laughs> he planted the seed, man. And now it's like starting to grow and like festa. And it's like irritating me. And he hits me back. So you think about it? And I said, yeah, I did. And you know what? I kind of already started doing this like a year ago. He's like, tell me about it. I do. He's like, I think that's what it is. I don't think we do an autobiography. I don't think you do a bunch of you know, cool guy action stories from Afghanistan. There's, there's plenty of that. And I don't think that's something that you're inspired by, which I was not. And uh, he's like, you know, keep, keep going. So basically COVID gave me the, gave me additional time and energy. Uh, a close friend of mine produced a Spock, the general population, those that were curious that I was trying to assist kind of began the process a year prior. And, you know, like with some things, I have a tendency to get real dialed in and, I found myself waking up at 2.30 in the morning and I just couldn't sleep. I'd get up, I'd be at the computer and I was hammering out five, 600 words a day. And you fast forward about four months and I'm at 70,000 words. And like all of a sudden you have a book on your hands. So it still very much is that same, that same guide. It's, you know, it's a manual from my perspective, uh, things I've learned and things retrospectively I found to have a lot of value in assisting me get to where I am today. Um, and then just enough kind of personal examples and vignettes kind of mixed in there to give each of these tenets and principles some context. So reader is able to kind of put themselves in, in my mentality. And when I realized how important this thing was, this is what I was going through. Um, so, yeah, 
I think buying anything crazy, Dale, it'll be out uh, this week, which is exciting. Today's the, what, 17th? Yep. Um, so, yeah, I'm eager to get it out there and really just uh, let the book do what it was designed to do originally, you know, two years ago, just just at scale. Yeah, no, that's awesome, man. Kudos for you. Like, I, what I love about you, man, is like, you just, you just take it on, man. Like all of it, like whatever, whatever's thrown in front of you, like take it on. What's it? What, and what's the title? But what, you know, why, why objective secure? What's it? Where did that come from? Yeah. Objective secure is a, is a tactical term that we use uh, most commonly when conducting direct action. Um, and if you think about like, conducting like a raid, for example, so you mm-hmm. got, you got mm-hmm. a structure or a compound or a house. And before you hit that objective, before you hit that target, you break it down into different sectors, right? Whether that's based on floor or lateral, north to south, east to west, however it is. And as you're planning your scheme, you've just got your target broken down into smaller sections. So as you're clearing and you're creating security and creating corridors to move, you've got sector secure, alpha sector secure, bravo sector secure, whatever it is. And then you eventually get to a point of objective secure, which means Mm -hmm. that you've got containment, you've got isolation, You've got, it's been cleared at least once and you've got relative freedom of movement. Um, You've got a place to reconsolidate. You've got a place to make exterior communications, right? And if necessary, you've got a place to kind of fall back to. So it's not the end of a mission or the end of an operation, but it is a significant point within that because it gives you that foothold and place to maneuver from. Yeah. Objective secure in terms of the book is is really the same thing right so you're moving towards your goal your dream your mission and along the way is a series of objectives that have to be secured along your route so just taking a macro goal and breaking it down into into smaller more obtainable goals breaking down over time yeah um so it, you know it's a, it's both a tactical term a philosophy and then also part of an actual strategy yeah yeah, no, it's it's awesome, man. The so yeah, I won't. I could keep you all day, man. It's like we we haven't gotten a bunch of stuff I wanted to get into, but uh, I'll, I'll we'll start wrapping this up. How do how do people where where's the book going to be? How can people find you? Hook up with you and and so on. Yeah, man, book will be available on Amazon. Um, signed copies will be coming out via our website, which is uh, machinenick.com. That's got links to all the socials. It's got links to the nonprofits that I work with and support, charitable charitable organizations. It's got a way to reach out to me directly, whether that's for business or just, hey, man, it's 3 a.m. and I've I've got some concerns. Can you help me? I go through all of them myself diligently. Uh, So by all means, you know, check it out. Check out the book if you're interested. And um, I look to hear from, you know, from the feedback based on it. Yes, sir. Awesome. Well, hey, man, it's been an honor to have you on. I appreciate you coming on and and sharing so much of your story. And uh, like I say, that's a your big inspiration, man. Like I said, I, I love the just picking your objective and get you know going after it, like leaning and getting it done, man. It's, it's awesome. So I appreciate really, you yeah. coming on and uh, look forward to Likewise. you know having you on again, get into it some more. I want I want to pick your jujitsu brain a little bit at some point, but uh, <laughs> we'll yeah, save that for another D, bro. So. Hey, but hey, I, I love it. It's a, it's a great story. I think it's going to serve some folks that, that need to hear it. So uh, thanks for coming on, Nick. Thank you. I appreciate it, Dale. Talk to you soon, brother. All right.